about. But tonight, um, I want to talk about something, something that's been dear to my heart for a little bit. Um, in our society today, well, let's start with this. The title of my message tonight is, How Do We Picture Christ? How do we picture Christ? How do you picture Christ? How does the community picture Christ? How does the Christian community picture Christ? Now, it's been brought to my attention that, or what I've noticed, is that society today, even our, our Christian community, we take Christ and mold him into what we want him to be. We've taken Christ, we've taken God, and we've kind of put him in a place where we want him to be. We have molded him into something that we desire. Instead of it being vice versa, where God or Christ takes us and molds, molds us into who he wants us to be. But today we have taken, even us so-called Christians have taken ourselves or taken Christ, our Messiah, and molded him into who we want him to be, placed him in this box. And we say, Christ, you operate here and make my situation better. But we see the, we see the life and the ministry of Jesus Christ as something different. How many of us have seen Talladega Nights? It's okay to raise your hand. It's, it's, it's okay. Talladega Nights, nobody's seen that movie, Ricky Bobby, only two people, three people, four, four people. Wow, okay. So Tal Diggin' Nice is a great movie. Uh, it's funny, very funny. Um, but there's this scene I wish I could play for you. I wish I could send it over there, but I can't. Um, but there's this scene where his, his wife calls out to uh, the family, and he says, guys, come downstairs. I've been slaving over this meal for hours. And then the camera pans across the table and you, we see like, uh, we see Domino's, we see McDonald's, we see Taco Bell, we see wings and all these things, right? So everybody's sitting at the table and Ricky Bobby now is about to say grace. And he's like, okay, everybody bow your heads. And he says, dear baby Jesus, I like to thank you. And he starts giving thanks, right? He starts giving thanks. He thanks God or thanks Jesus, baby Jesus, for his two sons, uh, Walker and Texas Ranger. Then he thanks, uh, he thanks Christ or Jesus, sweet baby Jesus, for his hot smoking wife. Then he thanks Jesus, sweet baby Jesus, for his, uh, his grandpa who is old and smelly and his leg is rotten and things like that. Then he thanks Ba sweet baby Jesus for uh, his best friend. I think his name was Dale. And they do this handshake and things like that. But we see that every time he starts a new sentence, he says, sweet baby Jesus or infant Jesus and things like that. And his wife gets all upset like, Ricky, he grew up. He was a grown man. And he's like, listen, I like Christmas Jesus better. I prefer Christmas baby Jesus. So I, that's who I'm going to pray to. I'm going to pray to Christmas baby Jesus. And his, his grandpa gets fed up too. And he's like, he was a grown man. He had a beard. And they're like, shut up, grandpa. And he keeps going, sweet baby Jesus, this, this, and that. And then his best friend, Dale, he goes, I like to picture Jesus in a tuxedo shirt. It says, I'm formal, but I like to have fun at the same time. And his, one of his son, maybe Texas Ranger, says, uh, yeah, I like to picture Jesus fighting kung fu ninjas or something like that. Then Dale comes right back around and says, I like to picture Jesus with huge angel wings with an with a angel choir singing lead. And I'm in front row hammer drunk. He made him who... We want him to be where we can literally, I mean, it, it sounds blasphemous. It sounds blasphemous, but it's actually what's going on today. People actually look at Jesus Christ this way. I was watching something else randomly. I just turned it on. It was Family Guy. And 
a whole oh wow you guys regularly watch family guy okay well this is crazy uh so the whole entire episode was dedicated to jesus they always do it dedicated to jesus jesus was the character right and he was going around he was like sleeping with married men's wives doing all this nonsense and i'm sitting there like i can't believe this is happening and they took biblical concepts and they tied it in there as well and i couldn't i couldn't believe it for the life of me there's another show black jesus black jesus this is that is the worst show in life that is the worst show in life i've i can't even begin I can't even begin. I can't. I don't know what to say. I really don't know what to say. But this is what's happening in our community today. But now we look at the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. We've been looking through Mark. Okay. We've been reading through Mark, and uh, right now we're in Mark chapter two. All right. So in the first, in the past couple of weeks, we've seen Jesus and what he's been about. Let me get my notes open here. Um, so we start, uh, let's start from chapter 2 again, beginning uh, verse 1. We see that Jesus Christ is going around healing, healing the sick and performing all these miracles. And he's speaking the truth. He's speaking the truth in authority. And a lot of people are following Christ. They're following Jesus because of the things he's able to do, because he's different, because he's not exactly what the law says. Although he's speaking truth, although he's speaking scripture, I thought I was still echoing. Although he's speaking scripture in authority, he's, he's different. But then on top of that, he's healing and performing all these wonderful miracles. So people are being drawn to him from everywhere. At the same time, we see Pharisees and scribes coming from all sorts of places, from different regions and city, trying to hear or see what this man is all about. They call him Messiah. So they want to see what this man is all about. But they're coming with different intentions. They're coming to catch him in something. They're coming to, to hold him, make him mess up, or see if they can catch him in something that they can use against him to then later on kill him, crucify him. So these people, and he looks at the one, he looks at the paralyzed and he says, your sins are forgiven. As soon as he says that, he perceives in the hearts of the Pharisees that how could this man forgive sins? He doesn't have the authority to do so. Only divine, only God can forgive sins. He sees this, he perceives this, he understands that they're thinking this in their hearts, and he calls them out on it. He says, okay, so yes, I have the authority to forgive sins and to prove it, I'll do what is easier to say what's easier to do to say your sins are forgiven or to tell this man to get up and walk but just because I say because I am who I say I am you pick up your bed and walk and it happens he picks up his bed and he walks he goes off rejoicing giving praise to God then we move on we move on he's still teaching preaching and then we come we see a part where Jesus walks by a tax collector by the name of Levi, who we also know as Matthew. So he walks by Matthew or Levi, and he looks at him and he says, follow me. Now, we know this is a characteristic of Jesus Christ, where he has handpicked everybody in his inner circle. He walks by Levi, a sinner, a tax collector, somebody who is deemed one of the worst sinners in history. This is somebody you don't want to be in the same room with or in close proximity with. They're, it's almost compared to a leper. You don't even want to be close to this man so their sins don't rub off on you. So Jesus Christ points to this man and says, follow me. No question, nothing. He just gets up and follows him. Now, they're thinking, why would Jesus Christ, why would you? You have all these people. You have this disciples. You have all these people following you. But you pick this sinner to follow you. You call this man. We see later on, we keep reading, and he's reclining with these sinners. He's relaxing. He's eating and drinking. 
not turning up drinking, but just, you know, being in, just chilling. Water, yeah, he's drinking water. No, he's not. But he's reclining with these sinners, relaxing. And then they come to him and say, why do you recline with these sinners? Why are you, why are you here? Why are you, why are you breaking the law? You call yourself a righteous man. You call yourself Messiah. You call you doing all these things. You're speaking scriptural. You're speaking scripture and you're operating in, at this level and yet you're dwelling with sinners. Why don't you hold to the, to the required separation from sinners that is, is mandatory? Why don't you do that? Why do you recline with these sinners? And the Bible says, verse 17, Christ answers and he says, And when Jesus heard this, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not for the righteous, but for the sinners. I didn't come for you who think you're righteous and perfect and holy. I didn't come for you. I came for the lost. I came for the sinners. I came for the brokenhearted. I came for those people. So it's not a surprise that I'm in the midst of these people because this is who I came for. I came to set the captives free. Okay, so now we see verse 18. This is where we start. Okay, this is, this is where the teaching begins. Verse 18, we're going to read. I'm going to read through it, uh, 18 through 22, and then we'll, con- we'll, we'll break it down. But first, let's pray. Father, we just thank you for another opportunity to dive into your word. Father, I pray, oh God, that this word penetrates deep down into our minds and bodies and souls, oh God, and that we learn from it and we take something out of here in the name of Jesus, that we become changed, we become renewed in the name of Jesus. Father, reveal yourself more to us tonight, God, and Father, let us not leave here the same individuals. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. All right, so now let's start verse 18. I read, uh, now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, and people came and said to him, Why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the patch tears away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear is made. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is destroyed. And And so are the skins. But new wine is for fresh wineskins. Okay. So now let's go back to the top verse 18 now we see the accounts of this particular account we see in matthew we see in mark and we see in luke now when three gospel writers account for such a thing we know that or it's safe to say that these things happen back to back to back to back sorry i'm a little gassy (laughs) so it's safe to say that these things happen back to back to back, all right? So now we see here, now the, <laughs> now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, and people came and said to him, why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? All right, so... What I like to do is when, when, when you read this thing flu, fluid, uh, fluidly or you just read it through, um, I like to picture them in the same setting. As Jesus was reclining, sitting there, eating, drinking with these sinners, tax collectors, and they approach him, why are you in the midst of these people? He answers them. Then... This happens. A few more people come up to him and say, this is going on. These disciples are fasting, but your disciples aren't fasting. I picture that in the exact same setting. Like it's just one after the other. All right. So Jesus, in my head, he's in the same 
He's in the same room, in the same place, right? And these people come. And now in the, in the account of Matthew, it actually says that it's John's disciples that approach him. John's disciples walk up to him and says, we're fasting. We're fasting. The disciples of the Pharisees are fasting. Why aren't your disciples fasting? Now let's break down what it is to fast. What is fasting? The word fast comes from the Hebrew word sum, meaning to cover or to cover the mouth. Uh, in the Greek, nesto, it means to abstain from eating, from food and drink. Okay? So we see in scripture that there's a lot of accounts or a lot of places where people have fast personally. They've done their personal fast from Esther to Paul to Jesus to David. Everybody has done their personal fast. But we see in the Old Testament that Jesus or sorry, that God demands one fast in the Old Testament. And that's the day of atonement. And that day you must fast mandatory. It's a one time a year fast. It's also known as the fast. You can find that you can, if you want to read about it, Acts 27 and Leviticus 23, you can find that there. But this Day of Atonement, just briefly, is where every once a year they bring sacrifices to, to God. They, take, they bring two animals or two goats, and they bring them. One, they, they sacrifice, and they take the blood, and they sprinkle it on the Ark of the Covenant to appease God's wrath. And then the other, they put down, and they speak the sins of the people. They confess the sins of the people, and then they let that goat go. They let it wander into the wilderness to be forgotten, just like the sins of just like God says, I don't know what I'm hearing here, but just like God says, <laughs> I don't know if there was a goat over there. <laughs> I don't know what's happening, but just like God says, he'll forget our sins. All right. So that's what happened on the day of atonement. There's more to it. Uh, I strongly suggest you read it. Uh, you go through and read the scripture about it. OK, you don't want to depend on what people are telling you. You want to read the word for yourself. OK, what I'm telling you is not going to get into heaven. OK, not going to get you into heaven. OK, so I need you to go back and really study the day of atonement. But this is what's happening now. A fast. Now, fasting is a period in time where it's it's not it's not a joyous thing to do. It's a time where you abstain from eating. It's a time where you subdue your body, you subdue your mind and your soul, and you just, you abstain from food. Now, we know that food fills us. We know that food gives us fuel, okay, to keep going. If we don't eat, we're weak, and we cease to exist after eat, not eating for a while, okay? So, but in this time, we abstain from all these things because or to remind ourselves that we are not self-sufficient. We depend on God. So we're depending on the scripture. In this time, we depend on prayer and scripture to fill us, okay? And also to renew our zeal and commitment to God. To once again be in his presence or whatever it is that you're asking God for, okay? So this is what's right with God, in order to be considered righteous, in order for God to have favor on you, in order for you to be like us, the favored of God, the righteous of God, you must fast twice a week. Monday and Thursday, you have to fast twice a week. The Pharisees did this. So now, Jesus actually, Jesus actually addresses this in his, in his, Sermon on the Mount. He addresses this at the Sermon on the Mount, where actually, let's, let's look at this real quick. Let's read it, Matthew chapter 6, verse 1. Because these Pharisees are doing these things so they can be seen. They're doing these things so people can see them and say, man, those are real men of God. So now these people Christ is addressing in this sermon where he says, 
Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the, or as the hypocrites do in the synagogue and in the streets. And he goes on to say, if you... Once or if you give to the needy, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you in secret. Then he goes on to prayer and he says, and when you pray, you must be not be like the hypocrites for they love to stand out and pray in the synagogues and in the corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received a reward. What is their reward? Being seen by others. Uh, but when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to the Father who is in secret. And your Father who is in secret will reward you. Then he goes on later on in verse 16. He talks about fasting. Fasting. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites. For they disfigure their faces and their fasting or in their fasting or so their fasting they may or may be seen by others truly i say to you they have received their reward but when you fast anoint your head and wash your face that your fasting may not be seen by others but by your father who is seen. and then a lot of people like to boast about it oh man i've been fasting for 48 days bro like it's it's been serious, man, but, you know, I'm hanging in there. I'm hanging in there, man. I like to boast about it. Oh, yeah, man, we went, out to, we went out to give to the needy, and we went out to feed all these people, and, you know, it's, it's really great. It's boasting about all these things. Why? Why, do you, why must you do that? So you can get favor with me? This is what Jesus is talking about here in this sermon. But then let's go back. Let's go back to, uh, to Mark. So we know that the Pharisees have now demanded two days fasting a week, Monday and Thursday. And these people approach Jesus Christ. We're fasting, but your disciples are not fasting. So obviously it must be one of these days. It must be Thursday or it must be Monday. So yes, it's... Hey, God, man, it's Thursday. Jesus, we're fasting. What's going on with your people? And he responds. And this is the typical response of Jesus Christ. He never responds to you straight up. Never. He's never done it. He always finds a way. Like he would, he, <laughs> he does parables or he, he, he creates a scene. He does something to target the heart. He maneuvers his way and he strategically gets to the heart. And you're standing there looking dumbfounded. So, this is his response. Typical Jesus. You know, how, how may I get into heaven? Uh, so, how do you make rice and stew? Uh, <laughs> go find a goat and da 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 da. So, this is the response. Can. The wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is still with them. Now, let me deviate a little bit. Christ is referring to himself as the bridegroom, right? Now, in the sanctity, okay, let's start with this. The bridegroom is identified by Christ, right? And the church is the bride. A couple of places where the scripture refers to this, to Christ as the bridegroom. Even in Revelations at the end where he says the bridegroom returns and his bride meets him and there's a feast, there's, there's, there's a celebration, right? So we see that the bridegroom, Christ, and the church. The Bible says Christ loved the church. Christ loved loved the church. The Bible also says husbands love your wife. How? The way Christ loved the church. So much so that he died and gave it all for the church. So you as a man, talk to the men here, 
you as a man, when you find your wife, or if you're married as right now, you are to love your wife as Christ loved the church with everything to the point where you're willing to give it all up, give up your life for her. Because Christ did so for the church. Now flip the script. The church. The Bible says the church has to submit to the will of God. Give it all to Christ, the bridegroom. Just as the Bible says that the wife is supposed to submit to the husband. Just as the church submits to Christ. Now, this isn't like something that it was like, man, Jesus showed up and he was like, man, this is a very good analogy to use. Bridegroom, church, married, man, this is really good. I'm going to use it. No, this is how it was deemed from the beginning. This is Christianity. The way Christ loved the church is how we are supposed to, men, love our wives. The way the church is supposed to submit to God is the way uh, women are supposed to submit to their husbands. That's the beauty of the gospel. The gospel is realized in the beauty of marriage if it's done correctly. So, <clears throat> Now that I've, you know, did that a little bit, we go, he says, can the, wet, can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is still with them? What Jesus is saying right here is that I, oh, wait, 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 wait. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I missed something. Now, how many of us, we, we, we know weddings, what weddings are like. We love weddings, right? Africans, we love wedding, right? <laughs> you know, our weddings, we last all night. You know what I'm saying? But that is nothing compared. Nothing compared to how weddings were back then. Nothing compared. Back then, weddings were a week, is a week long. A whole week long. They save up money, food, drinks, everything. And they party all week. There's dancing every single day. Nobody, no tire. No, nobody's, nobody sleeps. It's a wedding feast the whole week. So now Jesus says, can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is still with them? What he's saying is... I am here right now. I am in the midst of you right now. This isn't a time for mourning. This isn't a time for, for, for sadness and weeping and everything. No, this is a feast. This is a celebration. Typically, when people fast, it's a time of gut-wrenching prayer. It's a time where you're, you're, you're weak and you're just like, God, I need you in this time. It's, 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 it's almost like almost a time of sorrow and just just thirst and hunger for God. But God is, or Jesus is saying here, I'm here. I'm in the midst of you. This is not a time to fast. Drop an E into the word and feast. This is a time to feast. Yeah, I like that, right? This is a time to feast. So this isn't a time of mourning. I'm here now. I'm here. You like that? <laughs> so, can the wedding guest fast while the bridegroom is still with them? This is a time for feasting. This is a time for celebration. It's a joyous occasion. But there will be a time where I am taken away. There comes a time where I will be taken away. Now, this is the first this is the first allusion to his death. This is where Jesus first in Mark alludes to his death. And he says, there'll, there'll come a time where I'll be taken away. And in that time, that's when you fast. That's when they will fast. And I'm pretty sure they did. I'm pretty sure they did. Because we see that when Jesus Christ dies, he dies and you know, three days go by, he rose again. And two of his disciples are walking to, to a city, 
it starts with an E. Can't remember. I think it's in Luke. If you can find it for me, it's in Luke 24, I believe. But he, they're walking to this city, and Jesus Christ walks up on them, right? And they're walking. He's like, what are you guys talking about? And he said, they look at him all sad and gloomy, and they say, are you the only person in Jerusalem that hasn't heard what's going on with Jesus of Nazareth? Like, he's, he was delivered unto Pilate, and, and, and they killed him, and he was crucified, and they buried him, and, and you know, three days, and, uh, and the, the women, they went there, they looked for him, and they couldn't find him, and we went there too, and we couldn't find him, and they're just sad. You're going to find him, and, you know, I... <laughs> We don't know what to do. Like he's missing. Uh, like I, we we thought he was we thought he was gonna save us. We thought he was you know the savior and this 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 and that. And they and he Jesus looks at them and he says, "You oh, I'll forget the word. He, he he disrespects them. He's like, you fools. Like don't you don't you or don't you heed the words of the prophets?" And he goes on and he's talking and he's preaching to them and they're walking, they're walking, they're walking. And it gets to a point where Jesus, you know, he's about to take off or keep walking. And they look at him and they say, no, just come in, come inside. So he comes inside and they sit. And interestingly enough, he takes bread and he breaks it and gives it to them. Almost to say, I'm here. Almost to say, this isn't a time of mourning anymore. This isn't a time to cry anymore. I'm here. I'm risen. This is a time to rejoice. Here, take bread, eat. Then we see also in, uh, actually, let's finish that story. So he takes it, breaks it, and gives it to them, and he disappears into thin air. And then they say, whoa, wait a minute. Didn't our hearts burn while he was talking to us? Then he goes to the upper room. Where a couple of people, where a couple of disciples are there, and interestingly enough, there he takes fish and he eats it. As to say, guys, I've risen. I'm here. Don't need to fast anymore. It's not a time for mourning. It's not a time of gut wrenching prayer anymore. This, I'm here. I'm in your midst. I've, it's a time to rejoice. Have you guys? You've been in church when it's uh, um, Easter. And they sing the song, celebrate, Jesus, celebrate. Do, 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 do. You guys are weak. But yeah, this is a time to celebrate. This is a time to celebrate. So this is what Jesus Christ is saying here. There's going to come a time where I'm going to be taken away. And they're going to fast during that time. But as for now, this is a time of feasting. This is a time of celebration. This isn't a time to mourn. Then he gives another illustration. And he says, no one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the patch tears away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear is made. What Jesus is saying here is that you can't, you can't just take me. Man, this Bible is so versatile. Do you guys understand that? This is sewing 101. So what I learned how to sew from this book. <laughs> you don't take a piece of new cloth and sew it to new clothes. You just don't do it. Me, if I didn't read that, I would have been doing all kinds of nonsense. But we see here that Christ is saying that you don't you can't just take me and Place me. Stop looking at me like that. Oh, uh, you can't just take me. You can't just take me and place me in the old. You can't do that. I'm not a plug and play system. I'm here to re take over or fill in with a new system. I'm not here to add to your wardrobe, uh, a piece of jewelry to add to your wardrobe. I'm here to renew, put on a whole new wardrobe. You can't take me and put me in a place and expect it to just work. I'm here to restore. I'm here to renew. I'm not compatible with anything else. Two years ago, I went skydiving for my birthday. 
It's been two years, man. Boys, oh. It was last year? It was two years. I was 25 when I went. No, 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 time out. Oh, no. I was 25 years old when I went skydiving. Hey, whoa. Okay, so anyway, stop distracting me, guys. You should, should just let that go. Anyway, so I went skydiving, and it was the most exhilarating, exciting, terrifying thing I've ever done in my life. The whole time, they gave me a big suit and everything, and the whole time, I'm praying. Sea warfare prayer. Like, I was going in. If anybody saw me, hey, like, that's a righteous man right there. I was going in on prayer. Like, so we get up. I get in the plane, and I'm shaking. I'm sh shaking. And my instructor was like, oh, you cold? I was like, yeah. It's freezing up here, but I was terrified, right? So we get to the door, and we're going through all this protocol and everything, and, man, I just said, whatever. And we hopped out the plane, barreling down over 200 miles an hour. And when I tell you, after, after a while, it became, it was just fun. Like, it was like, I don't even know how to explain it. It was, it was I would love to do it again, Okay. But check out this illustration. I'm, I'm, bear with me. Use your imagination here. So imagine you're about to go skydiving. And you have a parachute. It's an old parachute, OK? Very, very old, tattered parachute. And it has some patches in it, all right? So you see it, and you're like, oh, man, OK, I got to fix this. And you take brand new cloth or whatever and try to patch it up. You sew it up, and like, OK, good, I'm ready. Pack it up, everything, you're good. You get on a plane, you take off, you're at the top, at the peak, and you jump out. You're flying down 200 miles an hour. And then all of a sudden, it's time, you've gotten to the altitude where you need to pull your suit, or shoot. And you pull it, and it opens. And because of the, the intense winds, it hits the, the chute, and it tears. And it tears from the part where you sewed it up. So it tears and it becomes, it becomes an even greater hole than it was before. So now, you're, now your parachute is useless. And now you're falling. You're just barreling down. The gospel says Christ jumps out of the plane, catches up to you, gives you his chute, pulls it for you, now you're fine, and you look at Jesus Christ, and you realize he has no shoot. And he buries, he goes, barrels all the way down to the floor. He falls, he dies, he's destroyed for you. That's the gospel. That's what the gospel is. You can't replace, you can't put Jesus Christ and patch him up. You can't do that. He has to restore you. He has to give you something new. Not a plug-and-play system, guys. He's a whole new system. He's not compatible with anything else. The last illustration we see here is essentially saying the same thing. But what he says here is, And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and the skins, and the wine is destroyed, and so are the skins. But new wine is for fresh wine skins. Now, what happens here is that when they make wine, they take a goat or an animal and they they gut it, right? They gut it and they patch it up wherever the holes are, and they fill it with wine, and it ferments. What it does is it it all the bitterness and everything drops down to the bottom and then they pour it into a new wine skins and they keep doing that until they get good clean nice wine now these old wine skins these old wine skins dry up and get hard 
And what it's saying here is that we don't, we can't put new wine in those old wineskins because what it's going to do is going to expand the wineskins. It's going to expand the leather and it's going to crack it. It's going to crack and break and you lose your wine. It's exactly what he's saying about the patches. I you can't take old skin. You can't fill me with old leather. You just can't do it. New wine is for new wineskins. I'm not compatible with the old wineskin because I will break it. It will crack. I can't feel that. And Luke actually, as I round up, Luke actually adds one more, one more uh, sentence into this account where he says in Luke chapter 5, verse 39, and he says, And no one, after drinking old wine, desires new. For he says, the old is good. No one after drinking old wine desires new because he's fine with the old. Jesus says that they favor past, they favor the past and they reject the arrival of the kingdom. They favor the old things and they reject me. I don't know how you picture Jesus Christ. Who is Jesus to you? How do you picture him? Is he somebody that you take and you just kind of put him in a box or you put him somewhere, put him in your situation, put him in your relationship, put him in your marriage and just think it'll work when you're operating the same way you've been operating? Who is Jesus to you? How do you picture Jesus Christ? Is he somebody that you can just take and patch up? And think everything is all fine and dandy? Or is he someone that restores? Is he someone that brings new? Is he someone that guts you out and fills you? Who is he to you? How do you picture Christ? Can we rise? <laughs>